this group, um, the IPA, because you know the world runs on the forces of history and psychoanalysis. Turn on the TV and you'll see it. Right. Um, the opportunity to, to talk about them together is very special. But when we focus on writing and presenting papers, we're freezing ideas in time and space. For me, history and psychoanalysis are not just about facts and ideas. They're dynamic processes. I'm referencing my friend Jessica when I talk about uh, what I call the literature taxidermy. Um, cutting off the heads of people or events, nailing them to a wall, describing them in great detail, and taking great pride in our ability to bag a really big one. How long is your reference list? Um, <laughs> history and psychoanalysis are processes. And my work in the last couple of decades has been about bringing those processes alive and catalyzing not just knowledge and insight, but movement. Two ideas, focus, two um, eyes focusing on a shared horizon can give our body politic clarity, perspective, and depth perception, and help it move forward toward the future. Two eyes that look at different landscapes and argue over which one is more valid make us clumsy and boring. So with that goal in mind, I'm thrilled to bring together two remarkable young men. The future is in their hands, the millennials, because we're terrible at it. <laughs> so, um, Sean is a moderate Republican and Jimmy is a liberal. And unlike the people in power these days, we'll they, have our condolences. <laughs> <laughs> um, they spoke on the phone, shared PowerPoints, uh, chatted for the last couple of hours, and they're about to share their different perspectives on the forces that promote and retard social mobility. And they're going to talk to, not at, about or against each other. And we look forward to inviting you into the dialogue. And I hope you leave having learned something, and having learned something about how learning something can and should happen. This kind of uh, dynamic exchange. And okay, uh, who's going to go first? Do you go first? Okay. Um, let me just hand the bio here. Um, Jimmy is from Torrington, Connecticut, and he's been involved in politics from a young age. In high school, he was the two-time president of the Young Democrats Club, and also served on the Mayor's Committee on Youth, a program dedicated to assisting the community's children. In college, Jimmy attended the University of Connecticut, where he studied psychology and sociology, and also was a co-founder of the Yukon Liberal Society. After receiving a master's in journalism last year, Jimmy now works as an associate producer at News 12 Connecticut. And you and then we'll choose John. Sure. Okay. Stand up here. So Alice gave a little bit of my background. Uh, oh, fake news. <laughs> I'll elaborate a little bit more. So I did start, uh, I was into politics at a young age. When I was about 13 or 14, I started helping on some local political campaigns. Um, something that was cool about that is I would make some phone calls, I would go canvas, and I would get to talk to people individually and see what was important to them. Um, as I got a little bit older, as I, she had mentioned, I was the president of the Young Democrats Association in my high school and also helped uh, with the Mayor's Committee on Youth. I was the vice president of that. We did some stuff for the local community. <laughs> Um, we set up some concerts that were safe for everyone, and we also set up a skate park, which was good, and everyone used it. It's still in use today. Um, and then in college, I founded the Yukon Liberal Society. We helped share some of our ideas with fellow students, um, and that's some of the stuff that shaped me today. I work right now at News 12 Connecticut. Um, our motto is, as local as local news gets. What I really like about that is we're really a part of the community. We give people voices where they wouldn't necessarily be heard otherwise. Um, so really, I'm all about community and equality for everybody. So without further ado, I'll get to the presentation I have prepared. Um, I'm going to be discussing social mobility, and what I will be discussing is some inequalities that are prevalent throughout our society that inhibit social mobility. Um, so the first topic I'm going to discuss is the idea of the American dream. That's something that we've all heard of. It's, it's talked about when we're children. Um, and I think it's very related to social mobility. Let's see. Let's see, just waiting for a little bit too long. Okay, so let's get right into it. So first, there are a couple definitions of what the American dream is. Uh, James Truslow Adams had described, who was a prominent author in New England, he described the American dream as that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone, with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. So that rings some bells. It's similar. It's based off of uh, the Declaration of Independence, which is the same idea, which is we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I think that's important. 
but they're endowed with their creator by certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the American dream is largely based upon social mobility. If you do your work, and put your head down, do what you're supposed to do, and you're responsible, that good things will come to you. So now let's take a look at some of the key terms of social mobility and see how they relate. So here we have the definition of social mobility is the movement of individuals, families, or groups through a system of social hierarchy or stratification. So there are a few different ways that that's measured, uh, but generally speaking, people measure social mobility or your social class by your income or the wealth you have coming in. Um, for the purposes of our discussion today, we'll largely be discussing vertical social mobility, which is the rise or fall from one class to another. Um, and there are a few different ways to measure social mobility as on the individual level and also as a society as a whole. Um, as you can see here, I have absolute social mobility, which I'll touch on more later. Um, and that measures the living standards of the society if it's increased um, as a whole, the society. And sometimes that is often measured by what percentage of people have higher income than their parents at the same age. And I'll touch on that in this next one um, about how attainable is the American dream. So this chart on the right here is a study from Stanford University. Uh, they compared the social mobility of several different countries, developed nations, to each other. Um, and this chart itself, what it measures is the link between a father and his son's income. And the more variation there is amongst that, or among that is, uh, leads to more social mobility. So as you can see among here, there, the United States is listed kind of near the end. It's 16th out of 24, meaning that we don't have as much social mobility as some other countries. Um, and as I discussed earlier, absolute social mobility measures how a society as a whole has progressed or regressed. Um, and in 1970, 92% of 30 year olds out earned their parents at the same age. And now, just over about 40 years later, uh, only about 50%, flip a coin, only about 50% of 30 year olds actually earn more than their parents did at the same age. So clearly, at least according to that, we are not trending in the right direction. But that is something I think that can be fixed. Do you want us to ask question things while during your talk? Yeah. No, no, no. no. Okay. We always do it later because okay. this is going to be a different process than usual. Okay. Sure. So now I'm going to discuss um, a few factors that may inhibit social mobility. And first, I'm going to touch on some discrimination in race and gender. And what better person to talk about that than a white male? So. Uh, <laughs> Clearly, race has a pretty major impact on uh, someone's social class. Um, so some, statistics, some statistics here, African American children are three times more likely to be in poverty than Caucasian children. Um, and African Americans are also more likely, nearly twice as likely, to be unemployed than white Americans. And even those who that are employed do not make quite as much, and they're in 72 cents on the dollar compared to their white counterparts. Um, and in addition, African Americans and Latinos generally grow up in lower socioeconomic standing and have worse schools with lower, with fewer resources. Um, so you think about it, in addition to just all the natural problems that come along with starting in a lower socioeconomic standing, if they go to these schools, if there's a high achieving, say, high achieving African American student, they, the school won't have the same resources, the curriculum may not be quite as rigorous, and the teachers may not be able to give them quite as much attention. So there is quite this, that affects someone throughout their entire life, their upbringing and what school they attend. Um, next, I have some media portrayal of minorities in, in the media. Um, so generally speaking, there was a DePaul study that found that African Americans are frequently based on disparaging stereotypes, which um, I think in that same study it also said that over half of white children actually base their opinions and their feelings on minorities that they haven't interacted with otherwise on what they've seen in the media. So I think it's important for the media and different characters to actually try to avoid those stereotypes if they're able to. Um, just here, there's another 2001 study um, that compared how they were portrayed against each other, African American versus white. African Americans were considered to be more vulgar, ungrammatical, violent, and more sexualized. 
And while that you may just think, oh, that's just in the media, it does actually have some real effects on people, not just how they're perceived by others. Um, there was actually, I believe, a 2006 or 2007 Cornell study that found that of inmates on, who were being tried for murder, that the defendants with stereotypical African-American features were more than three times as likely to be given the death penalty. So it can literally be the difference between life and death, just how people view that, how they view race. So next we have some gender uh, issues. And it's, this has long been an issue, but women do not make the same amount of money for the same work as their male counterparts do. Um, I have a little chart here. You can see it's trending in the right direction. In 1980, women made just 64 cents on the dollar compared to men. Um, now today, as of 2015 at least, they make 83 cents on the dollar compared to men, which is an improvement, but there's still a long way to go. Um, on the 83 cents on the dollar, that would mean that women would have to work 44 extra days just to make the same amount as men. Um, additionally, at a young age, uh, girls are often socialized to go into fields that are thought to be more suitable for women, whether it's nursing or teaching or something else that has a more motherly vibe to it, um, where they might not be as quite as high earning. So the next issue I'm going to touch upon is education. And I believe everyone can kind of agree that education, the higher you achieve, the more opportunities you will have to have positive upward social mobility. However, there are some issues within education that inhibit social mobility. So the chart on the have on the left here has a couple different countries, and it's clear no matter what country it is, the higher education you have and the higher quality of education you have, the more likely you are to have a higher income. Uh, higher income will lead to a higher social class, so it really just promotes a lot of opportunities. Um, the issue, there are a few issues there. Um, I have the second bullet point that the most selective schools, so the schools that will have the most job opportunities afterwards, the average student's family makes three to four times more than the student's families who attend lower schools. So really, the, the Ivy Leagues, the top schools in the nation, are generally filled with uh, families that come from a high socioeconomic standing. Um, also, this has kind of been something that's been an issue more recently neighborhood schools. This is almost in some way a way around uh, the Board of Ed ruling and schools are, people are assigned to their schools based on where they live and if they live in a poor neighborhood more likely they're going to be in a school with fewer resources. Um, this is just anecdotal but actually my girlfriend worked as a teacher, she's a high school student, or high school teacher, um, I'm not getting high school student, high school teacher. Um, and she said she works. She worked at two different schools this past year. One in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is kind of a low-income area. She said for the art department, they had about three dollars per student in the department. Just less than 15 miles away, she worked in Trumbull, which is a, a nicer neighborhood, and they had an eighty-thousand-dollar budget. So even just that close, it can really make a huge difference, just based on the status of the neighborhood. And the last portion I'm going to go into, I call this my Bernie Sanders part of the presentation. It's going to be about social programs and income inequality. So here first I just have a few examples of some social programs that have worked, that have done a good job of taking people out of poverty. Um, so I think Sean will touch on this later too, but in 1954, I believe, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson started the war on poverty to try to get people out of poverty. Um, and as soon as that happened, you can see here the percentage, it immediately dropped. Um, it has since kind of narrowed out, we've been in the same area, but that program did a good job of bringing people out of poverty. Another aspect of the war on poverty was he really enhanced the benefits of Social Security. At the time when he initially did it, it brought two, pe two million people out of poverty, senior citizens, just from having the Social Security benefits. Uh, today, or is it as soon as 1996, it was as many as 12 million. So it's really done an astounding job of helping out the people who need it. Um, and more recently, a program in the 1990s was enacted by Bill Clinton, but it was a bipartisan effort, uh, was the Temporary Assistance for the Needy Families Bill. Um, and that was a major success across the board. Everyone agreed. Uh, it brought people out. Once people were done with that, there were fewer people on welfare. There was, I think there was a 60% drop in the number of people on welfare after they were done with that. 
employment rose, child poverty dropped. So really, these are, just, these are just a few examples of how social programs can help people get out of poverty and give them the resources that they need. So this is uh, just a chart of the breakdown of who gets the most government assistance uh, by age, race, by the family status. Um, I think it's important to note that the people who get the higher percentage are usually the people who come from the lower socioeconomic standing. Sometimes someone may look at the what percentage of race gets in and thinks that somebody is taking advantage of it, but those are the people who do need it. Um, and one point I would also like to make is over here, this chart shows who the largest employers are in the United States. And by far, the US federal government provides more job opportunities than any other entity in the US. Walmart, it's actually it's impressive that they're up that high, but after that, you can clearly see it's really not even that close. The US government provides jobs in addition to the government assistance that they give their citizens. And here, this chart, I think, does a very good job of showing how the middle class has shrunk as over the past 40 years, um, where it was 61% of the U.S. was in the middle class in 1971, now it is just about half. Um, most of the wealth that has come in has gone to the top. 49% um, of aggregate income went to the upper income households in 2014. In 1970, that was just 29%. So while the middle class is declining, the upper, the highest class and the lowest classes are the ones that are actually growing the most, just further exacerbating the inequality that we have in our system. So I think that there are certainly things that can be done, whether it's legislation, a uh, better understanding of where people do come from, but there is clearly still a lot of work to do and we are not trending in the right direction right now. Uh, there, back to the home screen. Okay. so that we can talk about both the content and the dynamic between the two of them. Um, Sean Campbell. Uh, starting in college, Sean started a business where he traveled across the United States promoting mental health awareness and reducing the stigma associated with mental health disorders at universities and community venues. After college, while continuing his business, Sean spent four years in the nonprofit world, serving as a peer mentor to youth coping with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, and criminal justice involvement. Some of his most memorable experiences in that work involve mentoring youth who live near or below the poverty line, were behind in achieving their educational goals, had gang involvement, or were incarcerated at the time of mentoring. Currently, Sean works in an administrative role in state government in New Jersey, overseeing funding that's distributed across the state for substance abuse prevention. Additionally, Sean is currently an evening student at Rutgers Law School. Working in nonprofits, human services, and state government while attending a public law school, Sean finds himself in the presence of left center colleagues on a daily basis. Today, he will discuss his views on social mobility from the center right perspective he has come to identify with, reflecting on his personal and professional experiences. So, first off, thank you everybody for, uh, for inviting me and uh, being here today. Um, thank you for having me. That's perfect. I'll have a good time. <laughs> but, um, and I believe we should, you know, I think a lot of this stuff is we're so good at preaching to the choir. It's, you know, it's important that people preach outside the choir, so to speak. And I think this, this is the second time Alice has brought me in on one of these panels, and uh, I'm sure this one will go really well. So, so anyway, um, when I think about social mobility, I start a lot of times by thinking about my family, because growing up, I witnessed the, uh, the opportunities of social mobility, and I also uh, witnessed the diminishment of social mobility in my family. Um, growing up, uh, my father had a mentor uh, who was his high school auto mechanics teacher. And my father was kind of a uh, rebellious kid, grew up in a, an abusive environment growing up himself. Uh, but Mr. Becker, the auto mechanics teacher, was, was wonderful to my father. Shortly after uh, high school, which my father did not complete, um, my father got arrested and Mr. Becker offered to bail him out of jail in exchange for uh, one deal that they made. My father was to go to Mr. Becker's house every weekend and help, um, help Mr. Becker reframe all of the windows in the house. So every weekend, for a matter of a couple months, my father had to go and help Mr. Becker with this task. 
and this, this provided social support for my father, and it also built his human capital, because he got to learn skills that would be valuable uh, in his life. And, uh, and it, was, it was probably the most successful uh, intervention my father ever had. Um, for years, my father would go on to be successful in construction, not only the blue-collar elements, but also as if he had a very charismatic personality and would be involved on the business side. Uh, of um, you know of, of selling construction contracts, so Mr. Becker's contribution was wonderful. Uh, a few weeks into their um, their window repair project, uh, my father announced to Mr. Becker that uh, my mother was pregnant. They were 19 at the time, and uh, Mr. Becker asked, um, you know, and my father, I'm sorry, said, and uh, we're going to get married and we're going to have the baby. And Mr. Becker said, well, do you love her? And my, my father said, yes. And Mr. Becker said, well, then you have my blessing. Um, people told my father to run away, you know, things like that. People have told me in my life that I should have been aborted. They don't say it in a mean way, but they, 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 they say it as, a, as something that, they, they, they're like, well, that, maybe you should have been aborted. So I, I heard that. I don't believe that. But never, never would that have crossed my, my mother's mind. But, uh, so my parents got married at 19, and um, and they started a family. And I was that young child, and the Beckers became my godparents, and were close all these years later. Uh, my father was able uh, to do well in his early life, despite not even at that point having a high school degree. The, that human capital was incredibly valuable, as were his God-given uh, God-given skills. Uh, by the time he was close to 30. He was able to buy a home, and we, for a few years, lived a very nice life. Unfortunately, um, that was the first half of my upbringing. Uh, four years ago, my father died by suicide after long struggles with bipolar disorder and alcoholism. And in the 10-year downward spiral of that, uh, we witnessed a diminishment of, of a lot of capital, uh, dealing with violence in my home, uh, losing our house to foreclosure, my parents divorcing, Growing up in a period of time where I did not have health insurance, um, having the police at my house regularly at times, all of the things, and, and also watching my father go in and out of jail and ultimately spend time in prison. So, and having a younger brother who, you know, a lot of things really changed in my household when I was in high school. A uh, younger brother who really was seven, eight years old when these things really started to get out of hand in my household, who grew up with a single parent the father who was incarcerated within 200% of the poverty line, which is very different from less than 100% of the poverty line. We do, there's a big difference there. But um, what, what I think we've all experienced, my brother just graduated college uh, this early, well, this is June now, last month, and uh, we're the first generation of men in, in my father's side of the family to graduate college, and the first generation of men not to fall uh, victim to alcoholism. Uh, so, we're grateful for that. And um, so when I think about what's possible, I really try to think that in one generation, not, be, not just because I don't want to make it sound like if I made it, anybody can make it. I don't, I don't like to look at it that way. I just believe that we all have amazing potential and purpose. And I have to hold everybody to the same standards and the same, the same level of, of accountability and expectation. Because if we set our standards low, then we're not going to get the results that we want to do. And I believe that individuals have so much personal power within them that even amidst external circumstances, I think we, we still have to put the impetus on the individual um, to, to, to find mobility uh, in their life. And of course, no one does that in isolation. You know, we need the support of others. Um, but what I'd like to do today is try to take a little closer look at what are some of the, the, the basics that we have to focus on that we can't that can't get lost in our conversation, and um, and two, you know, where might where might we, we be losing sight a little bit? So, where my book? So with that, um, a lot of um, as, as Alice had mentioned, uh, my experience has been in nonprofit and human services work, and through the, those professional experiences. Um, sometimes I've tried to look at maybe even where I've, I've uh, been part of more of the problem than the solution. And uh, so let's see what, what we have today. So it's not as simple as this, but I do want to focus on what we know works. We know that if a person works full time, gets a high school education, and delays childbirth until marriage, 
the likelihood of poverty is significantly lower. Now I know that, again, there are variables that, that may sometimes make that a little, a little more difficult than maybe it sounds, but I don't want us to lose our eye on the ball. I want us to focus on those three elements that if, if we can help young people do those three things, you know, we, we can get them into the middle class uh, much more easily. Um, stressing family, stressing work, uh, and stressing education. And uh, to piggyback off of, of some of what Jimmy talked about, uh, in terms of where we are in the war on poverty, we saw that, that, that initial progress from, from 1964 to 1973, when we reached the, the lowest official poverty rate on record of 11.1% in 1973. Um, but in the last uh, 44 years, it's kind of wavered between 11 and 15%. And I think we have to look at the fact that we haven't been able to address that significantly. But on a government side, we are spending, we have spent tens of trillions of dollars trying to address it. Now, thankfully, it hasn't gotten worse. I think we should focus that there are some benefits to what we've done. But I also want us to take a more, a more critical look at some of the nuances so that maybe we can find some, some innovations. So, um, 92 different programs. We have 92 different federal programs that in some way are meant to address poverty. This is in addition to state programs. This is in addition to programs that uh, the private sector or nonprofits or faith-based communities may also be addressing. Um, when we think about $800 billion going to federal anti-poverty programs, some of that money is in the form of earned income tax credits or food stamps or things that are going directly into the hands of consumers. Um, other things are all of the administrative oversight and bureaucracy around these programs. And there are a lot of Republicans that are talking about the idea that perhaps we can look at really streamlining the way that we deliver systems and not looking at this in such a top-down way, but looking at it more bottom-up. Uh, I remember, a uh, I'll tell two comparative stories from my, my, um, my, humans, my work in non nonprofits that come to mind. And I think we'll, I want us to think about which one is top-down and which one is bottom-up. Uh, two years ago, a little less than two years ago, um, I was working for a nonprofit where a state senator uh, provided the organization with a $150,000 grant for mentoring. Now again, on the surface, that sounds great. And that's something that I think sometimes when we read headlines about these things, we automatically say, okay, well, $150,000 for mentoring, who's not going to get on board with that? In principle, I love the idea of mentoring. But when we look at how that money was actually spent, and I think that this is an example of things that are happening far off, more often than we'd like to acknowledge, the money was spent to, um, to pay a consulting company to come and train volunteer mentors to go out and do the mentoring and for the administrative oversight of this program. So we were paying people who lived in middle class communities to oversee a mentoring program to help the poor. And we were paying consultants to come in and teach volunteers how to do this. For free. No, the consultant, right, the volunteers for free, yeah. And the, the volunteers half the time were not even from the communities that we were trying to reach. And I know we all value cultural competence, so let's, let's think about this one step further. So that's, that was one example. At the same time, I was mentoring a young man who unfortunately um, had, had passed away uh, due to an act of street violence that happens all too frequently. And at, his, at his, the repass after his funeral, which I was humbly invited to, and um, the really wonderful family that had risk factors and had protective factors just like every other family. Um, I was talking to people at the repass and was, uh, there were a few people there that were from the community where this, this young, young boy, who was 16 at the time, uh, grew up and lived and they were perhaps at times uh, of pover uh, in, in poverty but not of poverty and they were telling me about how they were doing local mentoring efforts. Mentoring efforts that you would have never heard about on the news. Mentoring efforts that they were just so quietly and humbly doing that it's just what they were naturally doing with their time. One, one person was a track coach and a bank teller. And he's told me how he had mentored eight kids and how seven of them were doing really well and he was helping them get into college and how one of them he even co-signed a car loan for, thinking about the need for capital and, and credit and things like that. And I was like, that's amazing. 
and you never otherwise hear about it. And a thought came to my mind, well, what am I doing here? I mean, I, again, I was, uh, you know, I had a good relationship with the family and everything, but I'm saying, why was I the person in that circumstance? Why are we not finding people who are quietly and humbly doing this work from within the communities that we're trying to reach? Why are we creating this, at times, what it feels like a poverty or human services industrial complex? Let's figure out a way to get, I'd rather pay him to do this, or other people like him. And, but that also requires us, you know, advocating some of our power that we may have. Um, and, and really looking at how do we shift some of these resources within these communities so that we're not just simply creating a structure where we're just continuing to serve communities and rather being bottom up. Now granted, every system needs regulations and everything like that. We can't just freely give out, out money to, to people within inside communities either. But what if we were able to locate and identify people that are social services entrepreneurs within their own community and invest in them instead? I think we could do things a lot more cost effectively with greater cultural competence and get some awesome results that would empower a lot of people. So in terms of thinking about the human services and poverty industrial complexes, those are some, some ideas that I think we should really start to look to and we may have to humble ourselves as I try to do and I'm still involved in it a little but you know, where are we part of, part of the problem in that sense? Not to say that this is an absolute concept what I'm talking about but let's try to find some, some middle ground here. Um, I also think about where we can all play a role in volunteerism because when we're simply serving uh, the poor, sometimes we're getting the same skill set, we're getting the same mindset, we're getting the same approach. But if we um, get people that are volunteering, not because they have a, a government requirement to, but because they have a moral and spiritual imperative to, where people um, will just volunteer their time to connect more with other communities, uh, I think we can, we can have tremendous results. Uh, through my church, I found myself uh, just volunteering in a certain community uh, a few weeks ago, spending the afternoon playing with young kids at a, a picnic and meeting families and just give, giving my time and building connections. And you find conversations happen, and sometimes it's in that conversation that a job opportunity for someone might come. Because in this part of the country, I think you would agree, New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, um, we, we have areas, in terms of income inequality, of areas that are immensely wealthy and then five miles away, immensely poor, right? We have to figure out how to just have communication, human contact between those lines. Um, and in terms of volunteerism, we have some of the highest taxes in this area. Yet we have some of the lowest volunteerism rates of anywhere in the country. New York, at, uh, we're, at just not, we're around New Jersey and New York, around one in five, but we have some of the lowest volunteerism rates by state anywhere in the country, yet the highest taxes. But government can't solve these problems. It wasn't designed to, nor is it, is it, is it able to. We need to look to people to do that, and we got to start to shift that a little bit. So I think that's, that's something else we can think about. Uh, in terms of the three things we talked about, how much time do I have? I need like three minutes. So five minutes. Is that good? Uh, in terms of the three areas we talked about earlier, I just want to briefly touch on them, I'm not going to expand on them too much, uh, education, uh, employment, and, and, and family. Let's just touch on those briefly. Um, in terms of, of marriage and family, one of the things also we've seen since 1970, uh, around the time that some of Jimmy's statistics uh, that he focused on were, were the starting and ending point comparisons, as well as some of the stats on when our poverty rates hit its lowest and we haven't really been able to make a further debt. Um, the non-marital birth rate has uh, increased significantly. Um, and as we see here, these are things sometimes I feel like some of us are not always as comfortable talking about, but we have to look at the data and see the impact that, uh, that um, single parent families have on economics. And this is in no means a judgment on any individuals, but I think we have to start to just figure out how we can promote positive, healthy relationships and how we can uh, promote uh, family and oftentimes we talk about the single mother, the single mother, the single mother. We have to start talking about the fathers. They need to, they need to, um, we need to talk to our men about their, the commitment of, of family and the commitment of fatherhood. We also need to make sure that we do things to reform our criminal justice system to make sure that we're not over-incarcerating where it's unnecessary because we know that that impacts families. 
but I, I think that if we're going to have a talk about social mobility, talking about this, the value of promoting family is very important, and the value of promoting marriage. And I also believe that this uh, extends to same-sex marriage. You know, marriage is a conservative principle, I believe, whether it's, it's regardless of who the two people are getting married. And if, if some people in the Republican Party and others don't uh, get on board with accepting uh, same-sex families, we're going to create isolation that is also going to create more problems. So I think we have to just appreciate the value of two people loving each other and what that does economically, what that does socially, uh, what that does in all areas of, of wellness. In terms of education, you know, we, we, we both obviously, I think everyone would agree, the value of education. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a few things that I want to make sure that we emphasize in our children's development that I think will really, these are not, these don't cost a lot of money, but they're things that, thinking about how we structure things and what we emphasize can really make a difference in, in making that jump in one generation for our youth that we have to make. One is spiritual engagement that teenagers with an active, healthy relationship to spirituality, which can but does not have to include religion, are 80% less likely to engage in risky or unprotected sex, and are 40% less likely to abuse and abuse substances. I work in substance abuse prevention. We give out millions of dollars to substance abuse prevention programs, and we almost never talk about things that, I mean, 40% is a, that's a nice, that's a nice uh, impact. Uh, I don't think we should shy away from figuring out how we can integrate this while also still making sure that we're respectful to all different faiths and backgrounds. We, we can, there's plenty of common ground here that we can do this. I also um, think that we have to, um, I won't go through all these individually, but there are areas where we should emphasize um, school choice, which I think is getting a lot of criticism right now, charter schools, vouchers, programs, things like that. There are plenty of abuses and plenty of bad examples of charter schools, but there are also plenty of success stories. Um, in terms of, of it, to me, the only people that don't have school choice are the poor. Wealthy and middle class families have options about where they can send their kids. Even if they're not going to a private school, they can move and pick, you know, live in a neighborhood where they feel they're going to get it. Their kids will go to the public school and get a better education. At the same time, I don't want to say that teachers in lower income school districts are unmotivated. That, that's, not, that's not often it either. They're very hard working teachers uh, in, in low income school districts. I also don't think, I, at one point I do disagree with Jimmy, uh, is that at least for New Jersey, where I'm from, we, we have some of the highest per pupil spending in our lowest income school districts. Um, and we're not necessarily seeing the results. Now part of that high spending is because Again, we are trying to provide some support services, which, which is valuable, but I also think that one of the reasons that families in, in sometimes inner city communities want school choice or want voucher options is not only academics, but it's safety. I've talked to young parents uh, in their 20s with young children, single parents that do not want to send their kids to the public school because gangs are recruiting kids as early as fourth grade. That's not an academic concern, although it ultimately becomes one. That's a concern for, again, social mobility. Uh, I remember talking to a, a young woman last year who said, I wish I could send my child to the charter school or to a Catholic school, but I, I can't afford to send her to a Catholic school. And to me, thinking about spiritual engagement and what we just talked about, if that young woman wants to send her child to a Catholic school, I don't understand why we can't use a voucher program to make that work. We have to regulate it. We have to make sure that there, there, are, there are possible abuses on multiple ends. But I think that if we work together, we shouldn't create those opportunities. That's The top-down systems don't like that. But if we're empowering individuals and we're letting people choose the, the, their destiny, then I think, um, I think that creates a lot of opportunity. But again, sometimes we're not always comfortable with that. And lastly, in terms of jobs, and I'll just make this very quick, just a few points that I won't go into individually, but making sure that we're building human capital, just like how I talked about with my father. That experience of building human capital was critical to the success that he did achieve in his life, which did put my brother and I in a better position. Um, we have to find ways at every turn to build human capital, and there are ways that we can do this creatively. In terms of... Um, Young men that are, are getting picked up with marijuana possession. I do not support legalization of marijuana, but I do support decriminalization. 
Those are two very different issues to me. I think sometimes they're getting merged right now. But uh, I remember a young man I was mentoring, his um, punishment for marijuana possession was 20 hours of community service. Personally, I thought it should have been more hours of community service. <laughs> but the idea of community service, he got to volunteer at a, um, at a, a, a nursing home. And now he had something to put on his resume. Him getting picked up with uh, marijuana actually increased his human capital in the long run. You know, so we, that's, that's just in terms of uh, criminal justice issues, but all across the board we can find creative ways to build human capital. At the same time, we all, I think, have a spiritual imperative on, on the top down to really try to build connection. We have to, our communities, you know, as you, you know, because of sometimes what we see on the media, and because of sometimes what, is, what is, is, is true, unfortunately, with crime rates and things like that, we don't talk across our communities. We have to find ways of building more connection, so that way we're creating more opportunities for each other, we're, we're getting to know each other better, and uh, we're starting to, to blur these lines of inequality that do exist. Um, I think if we all, and, and if we focus on what our, our spiritual purposes are, and we all work together to do this, I think we can make some, some great progress in these areas. Thank you.